Lion Boy, Chapter 16 On his way back to the ring for the second half, Charlie saw Macomo, who had showered and changed out of his circus robes into an exceptionally clean and well-ironed pair of stiff white African pyjamas, up and downs as Charlie's dad called them. He was on the grand staircase with a woman. She had red hair piled up on her head and escaping in curls down the side and her skin was like a pearl and Charlie could easily imagine her in a white leather suit. Mabel. They seemed to be getting on just fine. Mabel was doing something with her eyes which Charlie thought might be what was called fluttering her eyelashes. He'd heard the phrase but didn't think he'd ever seen it done before. It was rather nice actually. Charlie stared at her for a bit. He wondered if they were going to go off now before the show had ended. Would it matter if they did? He didn't know. Might they finish eating early and come back early? On a whim, he rushed up to them. Good evening, Macomo, sir, he said. Good evening, madame. Macomo looked at him as if he were mad. The show is so wonderful, isn't it? You must get back to your seats. You don't want to miss the second half. It's starting any minute. You should really be getting back, madame. He grinned idiotically and sort of shepherded Mabel back to the ring. Macomo was confused. The old Macomo would have responded immediately, sending Charlie off with a flea in his ear, but the new dopey Macomo just followed on as Mabel, with an amused look, allowed herself to be led back to the big top and towards her seat. No sign of a Hungarian in tall boots, Charlie smiled madly. Macomo seemed to be going to sit with Mabel. Good. Mabel said, and her voice was low and beautiful. Thank you so much. You're a considerate child. Charlie thought it must be rather nice to be one of her tigers. Once he was certain that they were sitting down and staying put, he shook himself down and nipped round the narrow, crowded back stairs to get back to his ringside position. Once again the band fell silent. Once again the big top fell dark. Once again the drums rolled and the spotlight fell on Major Tibb, who, well, you know what he does by now, and he did it magnificently. Of course, and then he leapt swiftly out of the way as Hans came prancing out with his little learned pig. First they did maths. Hans would ask, what is five minus three? And the learned pig would stamp his foot twice. Hans would ask, what is two times two? And the learned pig would stamp four times. Stamp once for yes and twice for no, said Hans. Am I very clever? The pig stamped twice. The audience laughed and laughed. After a bit of this, Hans said, So, learned pig, who is the most beautiful lady in the audience? The learned pig immediately ran over to a smiling dark girl, one of the ones with flowers and balloons, and bowed down in front of her. The girls giggled and whispered. They thought it was funny that the pig thought she was beautiful. Someone else didn't find it funny, though. Julie's father, the clown, who had been quietly watching the maths, was offended. My lady is much more beautiful he cried, waving to his dinner date, but adding, No offence, signorina. The learned pig's lady was blowing her a kiss. The learned pig didn't like that at all. He squealed and took a rush at Julius' dad, who would have knocked him over. Julius's dad didn't like that. He made Hans go and fetch Major Tibb, who thought about the problem very picturesquely, holding his folded whip to his brow in deep thought finally suggested that they fight to a duel to settle the matter. He gave the clown and the pig a pistol each. The pig took his in his mouth. Then he blindfolded the clown and Hans blindfolded the learned pig. Julius' dad complained that the pig was peeking. The pig squealed in indignation at the suggestion. Then they lined up back to back and Major Tibb counted to ten for them to walk away from each other. Finally, there were two shots and both clown and pig fell down. The clown jumped back up again, but the pig didn't. Are you dead? The clown asked the pig. The pig quietly opened his eyes and looked around, then got up very gently and stamped once, then lay down again with his eyes closed. You don't mean it, you don't mean it, cried the clown. Say if you don't mean it, stamp again, make it two for no. Hans joined in the pleading and so did Major Tibb, but to no avail. The pig insisted he was dead. Then, Signor Pencorente, Miss said Major Tibb, that's murder. You'll go to court and be sent to jail forever and ever or longer. 
Julius's dad rolled over onto his knees and wrung his hands and wept. Hans was blowing his nose and whiffing too and stroking this poor dead pig. You'd better run away, said Major Tib, and take that body with you. So they rolled the pig into a sack and the clown started dragging it across the ring. Quite a heavy job, you can imagine. Suddenly, the end fell out of the sack and there was a pig in a flowery bonnet looking furious, bouncing with good health and chasing after Julius's dad until he caught his shirt tails between his teeth and they turned out to be about 12 metres long. And each time the pig pulled more out, it was a different colour and the lot of them were chasing round the ring. By now, most of the audience, including Charlie, were laughing so hard they couldn't breathe properly and at least four people had fallen off their seats. Major Tibb had to give them a little while to calm down before introducing the next act. Charlie was completely seduced. For a moment, he was just a kid at the circus. As the people gradually stopped laughing and caught their breath, the lights dimmed and a long, pure, high note was heard as if from a distant trumpet. Major Tibb, in a calm and almost trance-like tone, called out like a voice from way above. There's magic in the air tonight. Here, can you feel it? There's magic in the air. The trumpet note was still playing. It sounded like a shaft of light. And then a shaft of light flew out and lit up of the high wire platforms up in the flies. There was the trumpeter dressed in white, but though the note could be heard, he wasn't playing. A second shaft of light appeared and in its pool was caught the other platform and there stood another trumpeter, identical to the first, playing the long and slow note. Then he took his trumpet from his lips and the note continued. It was the first trumpeter who was now playing. The note passed between the two of them and it was impossible to tell which one was making the sound. Golden pinpricks of light appeared like stars on the great rounded ceiling of the big top and the two platforms rolled back towards the edges of the ring, leaving a third standing empty and spotlit way up among the stars. Magic, ladies and gentlemen, cried Major Tibb, and the lights flared up to reveal a huge green bronze cannon in the ring below, with a bunch of men fussing urgently around it. A flash of fire, a cry, a crashing explosion, gasps and a cloud of smoke shooting out and flying through the air towards the platform, a streak of gold, a zooming bird, a figure. And then, landing on the platform, clutching the rope supports with a gasp and a flex of golden muscle, was a beautiful girl with sleek brown skin and sleek black curls pulled tight back from her intent, alert face, dressed in a sleek gold suit and smiling broadly, looking for all the world as if being shot from a cannon and landing on a small platform 30 metres up in the air was her idea of perfect fun. Charlie barely recognised her. The one and only, the beautiful and magical, mysterious, adorable Miss Isabel and Dant, known for her phylaxis of fascinating fans and the fabulous, fearless pirouette, cried Major Tibb. Ladies and gentlemen, this girl can fly! The band broke out into a fine havanera. Trapeze fell from the roof and pirouette focused her mind filled her lungs, bent her knees a little, flung her strong arms up to the heavens and leapt about into the abyss. Well, she caught her first trapeze and twirled round on it for a while like a pen in a clever waiter's fingers. Then she stood on her hands, wedged her legs against the ropes and brought the trapeze to a standstill. Another trapeze flew towards her out of the darkness. Someone must have been up there controlling them and she flipped over and caught it with her legs so she was hanging upside down again by her knees and swinging gently like a flower on a tree in a gentle breeze. How beautiful and hypnotic it was. The music slowed. She looked so comfortable and calm. Everybody sighed. And then the habanera started up again. Trapeze began to fly at her, some with people hanging from them by their knees. And she began to fly around the roof of the tent from one trapeze to another, caught here by the catcher's hands being flung there to another, catching herself with arms and hands and knees or feet. She flew through the hoops and through hoops covered with paper. How could she know where she was going to end up? She couldn't see. 
Charlie could see the sweat on her face and the tension and the look of absolute joy as she swung away again and the hands released her to fly onto another trapeze below where she built up more swing until it was reaching the horizontal and higher and higher and she took another great leap somersaulting in mid-air as she went to yet another trapeze she was fabulous she could fly and then she and the catchers were flying and leaping around the roof in a giant game of trapeze tag and each time she caught one of the men for she was by far the quickest they tumbled and somersaulted down down from the kingdom of the flying trapeze onto the solid ground below like angels falling from heaven or birds banned from the sky pirouette alone remained on the high swooping more slowly now until she reached herself to stand on the big central trapeze beautiful and exhausted her curls escaping and sweat streaming down her face looking as gloriously happy as anyone charlie had ever seen in his life the trapeze rose up and she disappeared into the shadow of the roof charlie gazed dumbstruck he couldn't say a word she seemed to have had the same effect on the next act three clowns came in gazing upward in adoration calling to her, waving and beckoning, mopping and mowing, jumping up to be with her, crashing down again, bumping into each other and finally all lying down on the floor in paroxysms of unrequited love. Then a big green and gold wagon cage full of snakes rolled in and a belly dancer who took a couple out and danced with them and the clowns got scared and then she let out a huge snake so the clowns ran away. In a very comical manner. The huge snake was dancing along the ground, rippling and sinewy, and then suddenly it started flexing and thrashing about. What was it doing? It was a powerful mover, and then Charlie realised what was happening. It was casting its skin. It was taking off its skin altogether. The whole patterned slinky surface was shimmying and rippling down from the snake's body. So what's underneath? For a moment Charlie was scared. Something pale was emerging. Ah! cried Charlie before he could stop himself. And he wasn't the only one to shriek, not at all. A shivery snakeskin fell away. The pale, naked snake body slithered on the ground for a moment. Then, with one last great thrash, it reared its head and rose up onto its feet. It was standing up, on legs, waving to the crowd. With its arms. It was Bendy Ben, the India rubber boy. The crowd yelled as only a crowd that had been genuinely frightened and was now genuinely re relieved could yell. So then Bendy Ben did his last bendy act during which, among other things, he sat on his own head and fed himself with his feet using a knife and fork. Julius had told Charlie that Bendy Ben had sold his skeleton to a clinic in the Empire Homelands for 10,000 durhams. Charlie had assumed that the clinic would get it after Bendy Ben had died, but looking at him now, Charlie wondered if he'd already given the skeleton, having it surgically removed, and was now held together inside with bits of elastic. Charlie glanced across to where Mabel and Macomo were sitting. Oh Lord, where were they? He looked around. He couldn't see them. His heart thudded. No, stay calm, search the crowd, look carefully, scan across, scanning. Looking, he found them. Macomo was in his seat. He must have been bending down. Mabel was working her way back down the rows of seats, so she must have been to the loo or something. That was okay. Charlie would have been more worried if it had been Macomo who'd left, but he could do without that kind of fright. Meanwhile, the Icarus games had started, where Sigi Lucidi lay on his back and little Beppe Lucidi did acrobats on his dad's feet, including a handspring. And then the Lucidi men lay on their backs in a circle, each with his bum propped up on a wedge-shaped thing called a trinker. And they juggled their children between their feet so their kids flew from one set of feet to the other and rolled up like little bunches as they flew. Then Hans came out with his kitten. It ran up a very tall pole and leapt off the top with a parachute floating sweetly back down to earth, mewing and twinkling its whiskers. How sweet! Charlie was thinking, but then the air went out of his lungs and he gasped and froze. Sitting with Macomo and Mabel was a dark figure, shaven-headed, leather-coated, raffy.
Francis the cowboy rode in on a white horse, his monkey on his shoulder, shooting like Billy O, and tried to kidnap Major Tibb, shouting that he was Paul Penarente's brother and he would have his revenge. Charlie squatted like a frozen toad at the ringside. He couldn't move. He couldn't even think. He kept his face turned down. Away from the circus lights, away from any chance of being recognised. The trick riders were all riding in at once on their strong piebald horses, galloping after Francis and trying to catch him. The band was going crazy, but Charlie wasn't watching. He was hiding under his turban, desperately trying to gather his thoughts, desperate to look up again and check. Perhaps it's not Raffi. Perhaps it's some other young guy with a sleek shaved head and a black leather coat and the same shaped face and the same cool look. The ring lights dimmed for a moment as the rest of the trick riders disappeared from the ring and Francis took charge of their horses. Charlie risked looking up. It was him all right. Macoma was talking to Raffi and he was smiling. His eyes flicking around. Was he looking for something or someone? The audience was cheering. The drumming of the hooves and the sweet, salty smell of the horses came strong from the ring, and another smell like pine, the smell of the sticky, dusty rosin that was rubbed on the horses' backs to stop the riders slipping. Charlie felt sick. He stared down at the sawdust, breathed in the smell, and felt sick. Why was Raffi here? If Raffi had come for Charlie, how come he was wasting his time watching the circus? What was Raffi doing with Macomo? How did they know each other? How long had he been there? Had he seen Charlie? Charlie had to assume that he hadn't because if he had, all hell would have broken out. Down in the ring, two trick riders were standing on horseback, leaping, driving banks of fine horses, doing laps and calling out how clever they were. Charlie was frozen in position, the cheering of the audience ringing in his ears. He wanted desperately to sneak away, but he didn't want to draw attention to himself. And he wanted to keep an eye on Raffi too. Oh, this was a horrible dog with him. Was Troy going to come slavering and snarling? No, Charlie remembered with relief. Dogs had to stay outside during performances. The audience were cheering again, all except one person over on the other side. What do you call that? That's pathetic, this man called out. Charlie stared dazedly at him. He seemed mad, or more likely drunk. I could do better, called the drunk, and, heaving himself up from his seat, he staggered down the aisle towards the ring. All around him, people frowned and pursed their lips and cried, Oi, behave! The riders ignored him to start with, but as the pests started down to the ring and began shouting even louder, they reined in their horses and looked over to where the pest was and started laughing. Charlie wondered, could this disturbance be an opportunity for him? Think, Charlie, think. He urged himself silently, but his mind was too confused. I could do better than the lot of you, shouted the drunk unclearly. He was rather bundled up with a scarf and a hat he hadn't taken off and a big beard. The riders looked at him and laughed even harder. All right, cried one of them, Fabian. Come on then, big boy. You catch Francis, Francis the sharpshooter and we'll find some lovely reward for you. Francis, laughing, took off round the ring backwards in his saddle for a better view. Charlie, still frozen in position, was realising miserably that there was nothing he could do. He put up his hands to his eyes and glanced up to the seats beyond. Macomo and Mabel were watching the show with professional interest. Raffi was looking vaguely amused. Fabian was sneering at the pest. He unhitched one of his pretty rosin backs and handed, it over, and handed over the reins, saying... Here, why don't you start the easy way? Whereupon the pest clambered up onto the horse and toppled straight over the top and down the other side. It would have been pretty funny. Then the pest managed to get up, but the moment the horse started moving, he fell down the side again and was hanging on by one leg from the saddle. When he tried to hoik himself up, he went down the other side again and fell off completely. Fabian and Francis could hardly control their laughter. Macomo was leaning in towards Raffi, as if he were trying to interest him in something. Raffi was looking as if it was all a bit childish, really. Well, thought Charlie, he's not looking at me, or for me, which means he doesn't know I'm here, because if he knew, he'd be looking. So that means Macomo hasn't told him. 
The pest, cross now, was tearing off his coat and jumping back on the horse, galloping halfway round the ring and falling off again. This time he tore off his jacket, jumped back on and fell off again immediately. His waistcoat came off. He tried getting on from the other side and failed, galloping around, hanging over the saddle on his tummy like a sack of flour. The horse drew to a halt again, then took off again, rearing up so the pest slid off backwards and landed on his bottom. So perhaps, thought Charlie, it's a coincidence. Could it be? Could it? At that moment, Macomo and Raffi both looked up and scanned the ringside. Macomo pointed. Raffi stared and focused on Charlie. It seemed as if it with the weight of his heart lurching that flung Charlie backwards into the shadows just beyond the circle of ring lights. Had Raffi seen him? Charlie's breath came short. He felt his shoulders tightening and his lungs shrinking. Not now, he told himself. Not now, please. Keeping himself carefully in the shadows, he reached for his asthma puffer and started doing his breath control exercises. Charlie's eyes were closed, counting his breaths, calming himself, calming the asthma attack. He didn't notice when the pest threw himself up to stand on the horse's back. The horse looked as if it were about to take off again, but the pest uttered a great cry, tore off his hat, his long baggy shirt and... He opened his eyes. It was Madame Barbeau standing on the horse, a beaut beautiful in a tiny pale green sequin ballet outfit and tights. Her beard curled and oiled, her arms bare and her toes pointed in their pretty slippers. Ali up, she cried. And with a lovely laugh, the horse, which seemed to be laughing too, took off round the ring. Madame Barbeau balanced on his back, throwing her arms out and looking as elegant as you please. Charlie breathed, slowly and gently. He kept his face well back. Nothing was happening over on the other side of the ring. No one had left across shouting, You uppity little squit, I'll get you! Raffi, Mabel, Macomo were still sitting in their seats, still watching the show. Madame Barbeau was gathering together all the horses that Fabian had been driving and doing a tour of honour round the ring before scooping Francis up onto the horse behind her and delivering him to Fabian with a flourish. Charlie's breath began to come right. He seemed to have edged back up the aisle without even meaning to. I will stick with my plan, thought Charlie. I have to. There's nothing else I can do. It's too complicated to try and change it. I have a lot of horses to keep in line too. An image sprang to his mind. The lions all hitched up in reins and him driving them across the Seine to the station. He smiled and his smile made him brave. And then it was the end of the show. All the horses and the zebras came into the ring with coloured lanterns on their backs and took up their positions. They were forming, Charlie realised, a giant carousel, circling, corveting and caprioling in concentric rings going in opposite ways. Each a floor up from the one outside, so it seemed to rise like a pyramid in the centre of a wedding cake. And there, at the top, where the bride and groom would be, Tiny white ponies circled a rearing black stallion. Garlands and balloons and streamers of all colours fell from the ceiling, glittering and glinting in the shaft of coloured swirling light. Rose petals flurried about. The band played on and the big top roof opened to the sky and fireworks streamed up into the starry darkness. Charlie would have been beyond delight, but instead he was on his feet and running. <laughs>